I'm going to read more from Mr. Hushwant Singh's work. Hey, I just watched a little bit of the Australia News Channel's 25-minute documentary. And in the documentary, they're saying that six wanted an independent nation since the 1600s. And that's like saying, okay, yeah, Tibet was an independent region, but like it was only until the Shimla conference did China from the Qing Empire sign some things or did not sign some things with the British. So even though you can reach back all the way, like, yeah, we all left Africa. Like, that's how I feel their argument is like. It's like, we didn't want to live in Africa, and therefore everyone who left Africa is entitled to their sovereign nation. <laughs> and as Dr. Purnima Dawan has shown, like, so much happened even between 1699 to 1799 in terms of how Sikhs viewed themselves, how they formulated their institutions. And then this documentary, just like whatever was valid in the 1600 is automatically today. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this segment of history. A history of the six, because he goes into Kangra, capture of Kangra, and the expulsion of the Gurkhas in this History of the Six, Volume 1. The Treaty of Lahore brought little credit to the Darbar in the eyes of a people well known for their pugnacity. Fortunately, an opportunity to recover face presented itself a few months after the departure of the English envoy. Treaty of Lahore was the annexation of Malwa, so the Maharaja agreed to recognize the Sutlej as Punjab's eastern boundary. He returned to Amritsar where the details of the treaty were discussed. And there was a recognition of the Maharaja's sovereignty over territories north of the Sutlej and a concession to the Darbar that it would be allowed to keep some troops south of the Sutlej to police its estate east of the river. This was with Metcalf, Kangra. Kangra is where things get interesting. The Treaty of Lahore lost face for the Sikh. Samsar Chan, who was fighting a losing battle against Gurkhas, appealed to the Darbar and then to the English for help. To counteract Sansar Chan's move, the Gurkhas asked the British to join them in taking Kangra and offer tribute to the Maharaja if he stayed his hand. The British turned down Sansar Chan's appeal and the Gorkha request on the grounds that they could not interfere in the affairs of the people living to the west of the Sutlej. The Darbar decided to help Sansar Chan on the basis that Kangra was a part of the Punjab, but the offer was on the condition that Sansar Chan hand over the fort of Kangra. Sansar Chan accepted these terms and the Darbar's troops quickly moved into the position and cut Gorkha supplies with Nepal. Orders were issued to the chiefs of the Kangra region to stop selling provisions to the Gurkhas. The Maharaja arrived in Kangra to take over the fort. The Sansar Chan began to prevaricate. The fort, he promised, would be handed over as soon as the Gurkhas were expelled. The Maharaja was not taken in by the ruse, and since there was little time to argue, Sansar Chan's son, Anirod Chand, who was held as hostage by the Darbar, was put under arrest. Sansar Chan yielded, and on 24th August, the Darbar's troops were admitted into Kangra fort. The Gurkhas held on stubbornly despite their limited rations. When they were physically too weak to fight, the Punjabis took the offensive. The battle was fought along a hillside known as Ganesh Ghati. The siege-weary and famished Gurkhas retreated in disorder and the Nepali menace to the Punjab was ended forever. The Maharaja held a formal levy in the fort of Kangra. Among those who paid him homage were the chiefs of Kangra, Chamba, Norpur, Kotla Shapur, Jasrota, Basholi, Mankot, Jaswan Mandi, Suket Kulu, and Datarpur, 11 chiefs. Desa Singh Majitia was appointed Subedar of the hill areas with Pahar Singh Man, governor of Kangra. The Maharaja could face his people once more. His triumphal journey back was through decorated towns and villages. He reached Amritsar early in January 1810. 
The guns of the fort of Gobengar saluted him on his arrival. At night, he rode through illuminated streets to the Hari Mandir, where he offered a prayer of thanksgiving to his gurus. The scenes of jubilation were repeated at the capital. The Rajahs of Patiala and Jind sent their envoys to felicitate the Lahore Darbar. The short eclipse of the sun of his fortunes was over. Unification of the Punjab after Kangra, the Darbar returned to the task of abolishing the autonomous principalities within the state boundaries. First came the turn of the chief of Gujarat, who had fallen out with his son. The divided forces put up a feeble resistance. The old Sardar fled to the hills. The son agreed to become a loyal subject. Fakir Nuruddin took over Gujarat and all the forts in the name of the Darbar. The Maharaja himself reduced the Baluch tribes occupying the deserts of Shapur, Miani, and Bhera. In February 1810, he took Kushab and the fort of Kutch from the Baluch chief Jafar Khan, who was given a pension for life, and Sahiwal from its chieftain, Fateh Khan. When Ranjit Singh was occupied with the Baluch tribes, his generals were fanning out in all directions, bringing scattered territories under the authority of the Darbar. Dewan Mohkam Chand took over the estates of Bud Singh, head of the Singpuria Missal. Jalandhar, which was his headquarters and his territory, yielded an annual revenue over the three lakhs were joined to the Dharbhar. I think this is like rupees. He doesn't use a unit. Anyways, earlier Hukma Singh Chimni, who had incorporated Jammu, joined the Maharaja in reducing Kusk, which controlled the salt mines of Kiura. Desa Singh Majithia, who had been left in charge of Kangra, took the neighboring states of Mandi and Suket. Nuruddin occupied Wazirabad. Among the important places seized in these whirlwind operations were Daska, Halowal, and Mangla on the Jhelum, which opened up the northern Himalayan regions. Extinction of Afghan power in northern India. Second campaign in Kashmir. The month after the victory at Atok, the Darbar resolved to wrest Kashmir from the Afghans. By the time the plans were matured, it was autumn, and an early fall of snow checked the progress of the troops. All that could be achieved that year was to prepare the ground for campaign in the following spring. As the snow thawed, Troops were mobilized. Early in June, an army of nearly 50,000 men were encamped at Wazirabad. In the absence of Mohkam Chan, who was taken ill, the Maharaja placed the larger part of the army, 30,000 men, under the command of the Dewan's 20-year-old grandson, Ram Dayal. With the youthful commander were a galaxy of famous generals, Hari Singh Nalwa, Meet Singh Bharania, Jod Singh Khalsia and artillery commander Mian Galsa. This force proceeded towards Baramula and Shupayan. The remainder of the force under Ranjit Singh's personal command made for Punch. The Panser movement began in the second week of July. Just then, the monsoon broke in the hills. The Maharaja was held up at Rajori by torrential rains. The force under Ram Dayal struggled on bravely, took the fortress of Barangula on 20th July 1814, and went through the narrow pass to Adampur, Haripur, and on to Shupayan. Azim Khan, the governor of Kashmir, and his army of Afghans blocked its passage. The battle commenced in a heavy downpour which gave the entrenched Afghans a decided advantage over the Punjabis. Ram Dayal fought a delaying action to allow a relief column which was on its way to join him. But Afghan snipers forced the relief to a standstill a long way away from Shupayan. The Maharaja did not fare any better. The Punchis burned their standing crops and removed their livestock and chattel. The problem of suit supplies became acute and Punjabi morale was further dampened by heavy rain and punchy guerrilla bands operating in their rear. Then cholera broke out among the troops. Mian Galsa died from Karla on the way to Lahore. The Afghans took the offensive and pushed the Maharaja out of the hills. 
Ram Dayal stood his ground doggedly not far from Srinagar. Azim Khan did not want to have the Punjabi so close to his capital for longer than he could help. Having failed to dislodge Ram Dayal, he opened negotiations with Ram Dayal. There was an exchange of presents. Azim Khan professed friendship for the Darbar and promised not to side with its enemies. Ram Dayal extricated himself from an awkward position and returned to Punjab. The campaign had been a dismal failure. War had broken out between the Gurkhas and the English, and the Darbar wanted to be prepared for any eventuality. An envoy from Nepal came to Lahore, and with the usual flattery about the Maharaja being the defender of the Hindus and the hope of Hindustan, made tempting offers of money. The Darbar turned down the Nepalese approach and instead favored the company. The tide of battle had already turned to the favor of the English. The governor general expressed his gratitude to the Darbar, but did not accept the offer of assistance. The Anglo-Gurkha War was watched with keen interest at Lahore. When the Nepalese were defeated, the Darbar offered service to the disbanded Gurkhas. The Kashmir campaign had proved the need of hillmen for mountain warfare. Army administration, the purchase of stores and equipment, and the payment of salaries was at the same time put on a regular basis by the two Kashmiri Brahmins, Ganga Ram and Dina Nat. The new Gurkha platoons were put in action after the annual muster of forces at Dashera. The Maharaja personally directed the operations in which Bhimbhar, Rajari, and Kotla were retaken. Later that winter, the Durbar troops reoccupied the hill states of Nurpur and Jaswan and the Kangra Valley. The operation pointed towards another attempt to capture Kashmir, but when the snows melted, the army was ordered south towards Multan. Not much excuse was needed to take military action against the southern Muslim principalities. They did not send their revenue in time and always excused themselves that the Afghans claimed to be their overlords. Since Punjabi-Afghan relations had become openly hostile, the Afghans had been talking about reoccupying Multan. The new commander of the Durba armies was Dewan Chand, an officer who had rapidly risen in the Maharaja's estimation. Dewan Chand's first objective was Bahawalpur. The Nawab made his submission, paid 80,000 rupees in cash, and promised to remit 70,000 rupees annually. Muzaffar Khan of Multan was obstructive. Some of his forts were occupied and parts of Multan plundered by Pula Singh's Nihangs, so they are like militant Sikhs, before the Nawab paid up the arrears. Similar tactics had to be adopted with the chief of Mankera. The Nawab of Chang, who had been in arrears for three years, was pensioned with a Jagir and his estate, yielding four lakhs of rupees a year and attached to the Darbar. The district of Uch was likewise taken over. At the same time, on the death of the Ramgarya Misaldar, the estates of the Misal, which were worth four lakhs of rupees a year, included important towns like Gobindpur and Kadian, were attached to the Ramgarya troops and merged with the state army. The Fall of Multan, June 1818 Multan was an old and prosperous city. It was situated in the center of an extensive desert between the junction of two important rivers, the Satlaj and the Ravi, which provided water for irrigation and carried flat-bottomed boats laden with merchandise between the Arabian Sea, the cities of Sindh, and the Punjab hinterland. It was also the most important trading center for caravans which came from Central Asia through the Bolan Pass on their way to Delhi. Many conquerors, including Temerlain, took the Multan route to reach the heart of Hindustan. The Punjabis had made four attempts to take Multan, but had so far only succeeded in capturing the outlying bazaars. The mammoth mud and brick fort, which rose like a mountain in the center of the metropolis, had defeated them every time. Without the fort, possession of the city did not amount to very much. The guns from its high walls could hit the farthest suburb. The Punjabis had already severed the chain of small states around Multan, which were linked together in their allegiance to the Afghans. All that remained was Multan itself. The opportunity came when the Afghans got embroiled with the Persians on their western front. It was rumored that Fateh Khan Barakzai had been injured in an engagement fought at Khorasan. A force of 20,000 men under Mr. Dewan Chand, Dewan Chand 
immediately set out for Multan. Artillery, which had to play a major role in reducing the fort, was under the command of General Elahi Baksh. The Zamzama was again ordered south, so also were platoons of Nihang, the militant six. Preparations were made on an elaborate scale. To ensure a regular supply of provisions to the army, all boats on the Sutlej and Ravi were commandeered. Depots were opened along the route. On his way to Multan, Mr. Dewan Chand took the forts of Kandar and Muzaffargar. The fort of Multan capitulated on the 2nd June 1818. The fort of Shujabad fell soon after. The victor, Mr. Dewan Chand, was honored with the title of Zafar Tang Bahadur, the victorious in battle. The conquest of Multan ended Afghan influence in the Punjab and broke the solid phalanx of the Muslim states in the south. It subdued the chiefs of Bahawalpur, Dhera Ghazi Khan, Dhera Ismail Khan, and Mankara. It opened up the road to Sindh. In addition to all these military and political advantages, Multan was a valuable acquisition. It yielded an annual revenue of nearly 7 lakh rupees. An important change in the Darbar took place in the year 1818 was the appointment of Dogra Dhyan Singh as Chamberlain in place of Jamadar Hoshal Singh. The new incumbent was a soft-spoken and a man of impeccable manners. He introduced two brothers to the court. The elder, Gulab Singh, was an unscrupulous and ambitious man. The younger, Suchit Singh, who was appointed conveyor of petitions, was in addition to his native courtesy, strikingly handsome. So also was Dhyan Singh's son, Hira Singh, who soon became a great favorite to the Maharaja. The influence of the Dogras increased steadily until they became the dominant element in the Punjab Darbar. Thanks for listening, guys. Jai Mata Di. Hope you guys have a great weekend and stay safe because the weather is really terrible in the U.S. Peace.